you know, the health care crisis is something that's very important. Uh, our Canadian population now is 37 million people, 6 million of which, over 6 million of which, are seniors. And the uh, seniors represent more than 51.1% of our population. And uh, we're happy to report that there are 10,000 centarians in our, um, in our population in Canada. And that's someone who is over 100 years old. And that's uh, pretty impressive. What we wanted to do today is we wanted to talk about uh, several issues. We wanted to talk about uh, the health care crisis. We wanted to talk about the ra rising cost of um, uh, medical uh, attention, uh, drugs, uh, the flu shot. Uh, we wanted to talk about assisted suicide and euthanasia. And we also wanted to talk about palliative care and long-term care. Um, we've had an opportunity to uh, speak to uh, a doctor who is very much aware of some of these things that are going on. Dr. Kravinder Gill has been practicing as a doctor for over five years. She specializes in allergies and um, pediatrics, uh, but more importantly, she's a president of the Concerned Doctors of Ontario, and they are doing great work in trying to solve some of the problems that we're having with respect to our seniors and getting better access to uh, medical care. Uh, Kavinder, first of all, thank you very much for being here today. It's nice to have you here. I know you've got lots to say, and there's a lot of people here who are interested in, in uh, finding out some information. Uh, let's, let's talk first by setting the table, as one, say, one would say, when we're talking about health care and a health care crisis, uh, where we're talking about services, we're talking about cost, and we're talking about accessibility, and particularly focused to our seniors in our community. And here at Bramalee um, uh, Seniors Center, these people are concerned about these things. What would you, what would you say to to them and the folks watching at home about that issue? I think um, the first and uh, really important thing to realize is that our healthcare system is in crisis. And um, we have a healthcare system that's becoming increasingly inaccessible uh, for the patients that actually need to receive the care. And uh, not many patients realize, but Canada consistently ranks last or second last for access to essential care amongst all the wealthiest nations in the world. And uh, according to the Canadian in um, Institute for Health Information, Canadian taxpayers spend approximately $253 billion annually for a system that is increasingly not accessible. And uh, the World Health Organization ranks nearly 30 other countries ahead of our health care system. Um, in terms of quality and for equity of care. And the only healthcare systems in the world that mirror Canada's in terms of having a single payer system are Cuba and North Korea. So uh, we really need to um, come to grasps with the actual reality of our healthcare system, and that's that when patients do actually uh, are, are able to get access to care, um, it, is, uh, it, is, uh, it is good care, but the difficulty is actually getting uh, the foot in the door and actually having the ability to access it in a timely manner. But it sounds counterintuitive when, when we in Canada are so fortunate to have health care for all. I mean, that's mm -hmm. such a topic of great contention in the United States. Uh, and we talk about private health care, uh, et cetera. In Canada, we're supposed to be able to access it all. W right. Where is the disconnect? Well, what's not happening? Yeah. I think the biggest thing is probably the worst part of our health care system is, is having the U.S. as our neighbor because we then compare our our healthcare system to one that's also just as terrible as ours. Um, the, um, the countries that have highly uh, efficient, um, quality, equitable care in terms of healthcare are ones that are across the ocean. So those are ones that we should be mirroring. Um, what about the UK? The UK is emblematic to our system, mm -hmm. but they have they have problems as well. Yeah. Well, um, if if you look at Germany, for example, they. Uh, uh, compared to Canada, spend about 11% of their GDP on health care. Yet they have uh, double the number of doctors per capita compared to Canada. They the Germany's population is not 35 million. No, no, this is per capita. Oh, okay. And then they have triple the number of hospital beds per capita. But the interesting part is they only spend about 6% um, of their uh, of their healthcare spending on healthcare bureaucrats per capita. So Canada is a world leader in healthcare bureaucracy. Here in Ontario, we have the misfortune of having more healthcare bureaucrats in our system than we have family doctors, and that is the difficulty in that um, restriction and 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 a rationing of of essential health care are not flaws in our system, but they're bureaucratic features. And they're means for the government to be able to control and actually restrict the amount that they're spending on health care. One would think with 
35 million people in our country that we should be able to get a deal, as one would say, mm -hmm. on our drugs. I mean, one of the things that the United States is saying is that because of private health care and public health care, they're not united, so they don't have a common force to be able to purchase drugs at a more equitable rate in large quantities. Right. We're in that position. Why are we not taking advantage of that? Um, so oh, universal health care was one of the um, election issues that uh, a lot of the parties had had them brought forward during during a recent federal um, our, federal our recent yep. vote that we had. And um, <clears throat> one of the things that was missed in that conversation, which I wish was uh, presented um, to to the public in a more um, informative matter, was was the cost. So um, certainly we are going to be saving uh, in terms of uh, the buying power that we have. But, but, but that's something that would cost, according to the Independent Parliamentary Budget Office, an additional $20 billion a year to our health care system. And I think the important part to realize is that in 1984, when the Canadian um, a Medicare um, Act was actually implemented and that it was adopted. The in initial I intent was for the federal government to spend 50% of the um, of the health care costs for hospital and for medical care. The federal government share is now down to 15%. So it's so, downloaded. Yes. So it's 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 actually a shortfall of nearly a hundred billion dollars annually um, in terms of what they should be contributing to the um, to the provincial health care budgets. And that's why health care across Canada is so strained because because they haven't kept their commitment and 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 a contractor would never uh, promise to build additions to a house on fire. But that's exactly what the politicians are promising to do. Uh, we have a fractured and a healthcare system terribly in, 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 in crisis. And, and our senior population is projected to increase by over 70%. Healthcare is more of a federal issue than a provincial issue. I mean, as far as a budget is concerned, but there's a lot of downloading that's happening. For instance, here in, in, here in Brampton, uh, they need another hospital. They're, they're in need of another hospital. And they keep having discussions with both the federal government and the provincial government, and the community has to come together and put money aside to make it happen. Who should we be focusing our questions and pushing upon? Is, is it the MPs? Is, is, it the, uh, is it the MPs in Ottawa? I think it's a really complex issue in terms of whether Brampton needs another hospital. I think there's many pieces of the puzzle that are being missed and and uh, and are not included in the debate. So what uh, our our our, uh, our present um, second so-called hospital, which is really a glorified a walk-in walk clinic, clinic. <laughs> uh, which, which has very limited hours. Mm -hmm. um, our first priority should be making that into a fully functioning hospital because presently it is a glorified walk-in clinic. That it, it is nothing more than that. And, and, and when that had initially opened up, rather than the province giving new funding for services there, many of the existing services at our, at our actual hospital were simply moved into that facility, so rather than new um, dollars coming well, through the actual Well, talk to a paramedic, one of those guys that are driving the ambulances when they're taking emergencies, yes. and they get diverted. Absolutely. I mean, that's a serious consideration. And our, and our only hospital is is one of the busiest in the country. It's just almost every year, uh, nearly 5,000 patients are being treated in our ER hallways. Uh, we have suicidal patients which come to our ER, are stabilized, and then can wait up to 18 months to see a psychiatrist. We have patients that are receiving palliative care in our ER hallways because that's the only place for them to receive palliative care. We have mm -hmm. operating rooms that are simpting, sitting empty um, because of rationing of essential health care. So uh, I think the two priorities that need to happen even before we build another hospital because it, even if we get a commitment from from all levels of government for for an actual hospital th that won't be built for another 10 years it won't actually become a reality for 10 years but our crisis is actually right now and 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 the funding that oh, that the government puts forward is just for bricks and mortar so it does not include funding for the front lines and presently frontline funding is actually what's being rationed so we have this these beautiful facilities bricks and uh, um, a fancy interior decorating and in like both of these um, 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 
uh, so the urgent care and then the hospital, but we don't have funding for front lines and that's what's being rationed. So what our community should be rallying behind is one, getting urgent uh, funding to our only hospital so we can um, open up our OR, uh, ORs. We can actually provide the frontline staffing that we need to provide care, uh, get urgent funding to our urgent care facilities so that we can actually make that into a fully functioning hospital. See, that, that, that's a very frustrating statement that you make because there are people here in Brampton who had a tax levy that was attached to their tax bill, specifically adding money to a new hospital. And part of the agreement in uh, generating a new facility was that the people of Brampton, the municipality, and the people right. themselves, and, and, and donations, et cetera, to fund certain um, uh, technology and elements within the hospital itself. Right. Right. So it, it's a frustrating thing. I, I just want to focus back before we go on to our next topic. Who should we be focusing this question to? Is it our parliamentary leaders? Is it a combination of the two? How, how do we get that message? Because it doesn't seem mm -hmm. uh, that it's, it's being I think being we heard. need to be applying pressure on our provincial government first and foremost. So healthcare is a provincial jurisdiction. That's where our pressure needs to be. Uh, we're being treated as... But they get money from the federal government, though. They do, but but ultimately, oh, the decision on where that that, that funding goes mm -hmm. is actually made by um, Premier Wynne, and, uh, sorry, Premier Ford, I should say, uh, and... <laughs> and, and, um, and um, Elliot. So, um, so though, so our premier and and the actual health minister. So Christine Elliot would be a focus then, if we were going absolutely. To talk, yeah. And and we're treating us as a second class of the citizens because we are um, actually contributing equal dollars in terms of tax dollars compared to every other Ontarian, but per capita. Our um, Brampton is getting the uh, the lowest amount of healthcare funding uh, compared to all other cities and compared to all other regions in the province. So sh we should be really fighting for our fair share. There is no reason why we why we get such low per capita funding, and that's been chronic. And that's why um, we have uh, we're the oh, we're the epicenter mm. of. Of, of our entire healthcare crisis here in the province, and, and we're being neglected. So I, I hear your emotion and I hear your frustration. You are the president of the Concerned Doctors of Ontario, and that would be a voice, let us say, that is going to the governments and saying that we need to get some. How does your presidency and advocacy with that organization help to push the peanut forward, as one would say? We, we continue to make a lot of noise. Uh, we continue to make a lot of noise. We continue to try to bring the health care issues to the forefront, uh, both during the provincial election and during the federal election. Uh, so we try to inform Ontarians, we try to inform Canadians about the health care crisis because the best advocates are you. Right? What's your website for those who are watching? Um, carenotcuts.ca. Carenotcuts.ca. Um, let's go on to our next topic, and that's about the rising cost of medicine. When we're talking about uh, the rising cost of drugs, we're talking about accessibility. There were also um, some federal uh, leaders that were talking about free eyeglasses, free dental care. Um, that's an extension of what's already being given in m medical um, uh, facilities for all. Mm -hmm. where, where do you see that going? Costs are only going up. How could one conceivably think that by adding dental care and eye care is going to in any way enhance the service? And right here on the front lines, in our last visit here to, to Bramley's uh, senior center here, there were several people who uh, brought up the position that they can't get a flu shot uh, because they can't leave the facility. Right. And no one's coming here to help them. And it was an interesting point that was brought up. That would be something for some of our uh, folks that are doing the health shot. Uh, I, I don't want to name names, but you're talking about conventional drug stores and, and, and or people that would come and assist old age homes and say, we're going to give the flu shot this day. Mm -hmm. So how do you put that all into, it, it's kind of a messy soup of costs, right. access and rising costs mm -hmm. and uh, the potential talking about eyeglasses and dental care. So as I was... Uh, um, actually mentioning earlier, so our senior population is projected to increase by over 70% in the next 20 years. And all levels of government have absolutely failed to plan for this. So they knew it was coming, but they work on a, an, an, a four-year election cycle. So none of our governments at any level across the country have any plan for this. And so they simply go from election cycle to election cycle. And, 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 and all they are doing is simply restricting and rationing frontline health care. 
And that's what we're seeing on the front lines. And that's why burnout rates on the front lines for doctors are so high, because we're having a lot of difficulty connecting our patients to the essential care that they need. Uh, we have seniors here in our community, because the year um, wait list for joint replacements is so long, many are actually now leaving the country to be able to have timely access. Um, and, and, and we have over a million patients in our province that don't have a family doctor. And, and we see government after government, it doesn't matter which party it is, they make election promises, but once they actually form government, they do the exact same thing the previous government did, and they break their election promises. And, we, and they keep cutting from front lines while, while spinning it as being investments. I think the most crucial takeaway um, from today should be um, that the governments very easily disguise cuts as being investments. And, and we saw that with Wynn's government, and we're seeing that again with Ford's government. And how they do that is, um, is by um, limiting the amount of funding that they give to just maintain status quo. So according to the Independent Financial Accountability Officer for the province, health care costs every year need to increase by at least 5 to 7% annually just to maintain our status quo. That's the bare minimum, bare bones, just to maintain status quo. What Wynn's government did and what Ford's government is still doing is significantly underfunding the annual increase that's needed to maintain status quo, which accounts for inflation, our growing and, um, senior population needing more complex care, and, and our and our growing population in general. And, and Ford's government has only committed to 1.6%. So you can see that's significantly less than the 5 to 7% needed to maintain status quo. So when they tout that they're investing so and so millions, um, it's cuts because they are not maintaining the bare essential minimums, which is what Wynn's government did before Ford's government. So when you see these chronic cuts happening year upon year, it actually uh, further adds more fuel to the fire that exists on the front lines. And that's why you see hallway medicine is because community care with family doctors and with specialists is being so heavily restricted. According to the Financial Accountability Officer's report that came out in the spring, um, Ford's government um, uh, from now until 2023 would actually have to fund almost $8 billion more into health care than they have currently committed just to maintain, again, status quo. Um, so uh, so that's what concerns me when I hear politicians talk about health care, is that they're deceiving Ontarians, and, and, and we're seeing the same thing happen at the federal level, where they're deceiving Canadians because they're promising free, oh, universal, free universal pharmacare, but that's $20 billion that will then come out from the um, provincial health transfers that they should be go um, actually providing, which they keep cutting their commitment from. So you see, you've kind of outlined this uh, for us. We're speaking to Dr. Kavinder Gill. Um, there, there is a deficiency. How do we keep their feet to the fire? Why is, is Christine Elliott not listening to this and, and facing the fact? I know every... every um, a politician wants to reduce their budget and they don't want to spend as much, mm -hmm. uh, or conceivably that's what their objective is. In this particular instance, the baby boomers from 1953 to 1963 are the next emerging group. Right. And right. some of them are a little more needy than the folks that we have in this room here today, yes. who uh, went through a couple of wars and a depression and are pretty hardy in their and their ability to take care of themselves. I, I, I dread what's going to happen with some of the baby boomers uh, out there come along. Uh, just to put a bow on this cost uh, element, what about the, uh, what about the advent of uh, free uh, eyeglasses and free dental care? Mm -hmm. uh, since it sounds like we're not even equipped to uh, address the problems and the, and right. the situation that we have now, right. is that just a pipe dream? I think we should be um, um, prioritizing providing those services to those in in our populations that oh that need it, um, as opposed to providing it to everyone, uh, including those people who already have private plans uh, through their employers, mm. etc. Um, another thing which which many don't actually realize is when OHIP Plus first came out um, under under Wynn's government. Um, as a pediatrician, um, medications, puffers, um, 
oh, some of my colleagues for anti-seizure medications that mm -hmm. they were providing uh, oh, for children that were stable on those medications. Once the provincial formulary came, came along, it, uh, it, it was only covering very old generic medications. So many patients who were stable on certain medications for two, for five years, which their own private plans had covered, they were being denied access to those medications because the, or the private insurers were now saying, well, that's now a provincial responsibility. And the provincial plans weren't covering it. So then um, pediatricians were being forced to, to actually switch patients that were stable on certain medications to much inferior medication that was not ideal for those patients. That's my fear as to what will happen with, with the rest of um, seniors and, and and I'm Canadians once we switch over, uh, if we do at some point, to a universal pharmacare plan is that we will have a restricted formulary which will um, be generic medications and, and will limit uh, in terms of what is actually uh, covered compared to private plans which Canadians currently have, which tend to cover um, uh, a greater, broader range of actual medications and newer, innovative medications which are much more expensive, which are not covered by government formularies. Hmm. Our next topic is uh, euthanasia and assisted suicide. It's interesting, in, in the small country of Switzerland, if uh, you make application to the government and you have an ailment or a, a disease that uh, will eventually end your life, you have the ability to have your life ended on your terms, where you don't have to have uh, palliative care and you don't have to sit in the hospital, where someone makes a decision and says... You know, on such and such a date, um, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna pass on. Uh, there are two uh, schools of thought here. There there are some that that, uh, that say killing oneself is not correct in whatever religion that you wish to ascribe to. Uh, there are others that say, why would I want to uh, exist as a as as a full functioning human being and address the fact that all my faculties are going to deteriorate. And I'm going to be put in a situation which is going to be detrimental to my, um, I should once say, my way of life, my, 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 my way to live, and that it is their decision. And again, some people say, well, there's always a chance of something uh, coming to rescue or, or, or something to miraculously happen. And again, the other side says, well, what if a family comes together and says that um, our loved one has gotten to a point where we believe it is in her best interest or his best interests uh, to be able to end their life. It's a very controversial subject. It's uh, Even if someone says that they give someone power of attorney, um, if you're of uh, sound mind and body and legally you give that to a family member, uh, there are still uh, groups, hospitals and, and uh, doctors who feel that that is an incorrect way to proceed. But there are many people who want to be able to determine their own destiny. Mm -hmm. how, would you, how would you put a bow on that with respect to euthanasia mm -hmm. and, and self-assisted suicide? I think the debate on whether we should have it or not, I think we've, uh, as a country, have already had that debate because it's already now legal. Okay, mm -hmm. so, um, so those who have a reasonable, foreseeable, um, um, natural death um, uh, currently under the current Canadian law can have access to either physician-assisted suicide or to euthanasia, which uh, under the Canadian legislation is called medical aid in dying. Um, and, uh, and there's strict criteria presently for that. Um, what I have concerns about and what many um, Canadian physicians have concerns about is uh, the empty promise of choice. Um, so um, choice. What do, you, what, can, do you mean by, what do you mean by that? So choice can only exist if you have equal access to your options. Presently, uh, over 85 percent of Canadians do not have access to palliative care, and we patients are having extreme difficulty accessing essential health care. So we have limited resources and funding from all levels of government going towards palliative care and we have prioritization towards euthanasia. In other countries that legalized a euthanasia, for example, Luxembourg and, and, um, and, and, and um, Sweden, I believe, Sweden, they, had, they had actually heavily uh, invested in palliative care. So um, one of those countries heavily invested in palliative care before ushering in 
um, or the right to die. Uh, and, the, and, and the other country had actually legislated the right to life. So patients must be guaranteed access to palliative care So as a doctor, are you saying if we, don't, if we don't have enough services to take care of them in the condition that they are, uh, assisted suicide or euthanasia is an incorrect route out because the real problem is they don't have enough care? No, I'm not saying that it's the incorrect route. So I, th I think patients should, uh, patients who have, um, who meet the criteria should be able uh, to have the, uh, the, the choice and the option to decide uh, how they live their life or how they end their life if they meet the set criteria. However, what I'm saying is that it's currently an empty promise of a choice. A choice can only exist if you have equal access to options. If you don't have access to palliative care, and you don't have access to the health care that you need, then it's really not a choice. And that is, that is uh, the concern that I have. But are you, not, are you not looking at someone who is an unfortunate cancer patient or an advanced ALS patient mm -hmm. who knows from a, a, a doctor and a diagnostic evaluation that there is a certain runway that you have left. Right. And when you reach that certain bump in the runway, it's only going to get worse. Right. And before it gets worse, you want to say goodbye on your terms, yeah. and you want to leave on your terms. Yeah. So, so those patients should have that option, but they should also have equal access to palliative care. They can certainly deny that they, if they have access to it, uh, and it's and it's available, and it's not a route that they want to pursue. Well, that's their choice. Mm. But, uh, but but they should have access to that. If they don't have access to palliative care, and their only option that the government is providing is physician-assisted suicide or or euthanasia. Um, then the patient's really choosing between suffering or, or death, right? So palliative care provides uh, patients with emotional, physical um, support, both for them and their families. Um, oh, my mom was a palliative care patient for the last four months of her life uh, after, after her long battle with breast cancer. She had a very peaceful death. Um, the, um, she, with the type of care that she had, which was both a combination of home and, and, and hospital-based palliative care, no longer exists. So the type of care my mom was fortunate to receive no longer exists for patients here in this province. Um, I thought there was, for terminal cancer patients, there were uh, many hospices. I mean, hospice is another word for palliative care, is it not? So there's no community hospice in Brampton. Um, when I first started advocating, um, it was about four years ago when a patient had shared with me uh, that her, t uh, her husband, who had terminal cancer, died in our local ER because that was the only place for him to receive palliative care. So um, we really need to be pushing our governments in terms of uh, investing in palliative care, in terms of investing in health care. We currently have ads running at our urgent care center in the triage and the ER waiting rooms advertising for euthanasia as the only means to end suffering. We are baiting our most vulnerable patients. So we really need to be protecting our vulnerable patients. I have significant concerns with um, um, our Prime Minister, who during the election uh, debate had said that uh, if he formed government within six months, he would remove the current uh, criteria that are, um, that are in place for our uh, euthanasia um, laws, which are there to protect the vulnerable patients. So now we have the Canadian Council uh, for Canadians um, with Disabilities, the Canadian Association for Community Living, along with Concerned Ontario Doctors and about 72 other organizations across the country that are advocating and lobbying the federal government to ensure that protections stay in place to protect our most vulnerable patients uh, against uh, abuses of the law. So when you compare palliative care and long-term care, long-term care is someone who is still... Uh, the, has the ability to be treated. Palliative care is basically looking at that runway mm -hmm. and guiding them to 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 a calm and peaceful end. Is is that a fair is that a fair uh, description? Long term care can also include palliative care. So palliative care is not simply end end of life care. Um, it is actually uh, any type of care. Um, oftentimes with patients who have a chronic illness that helps to improve their quality of life. Uh, so it's um, often um, uh, associated as being simply end-of-life care, but it's actually care that's uh, provided throughout a patient's entire illness. 
So when we say that there's not enough uh, palliative care or none from your standpoint in the city of Brampton, um, how, do we, how do we motivate that when we're already having problems just accessing right. health care in general? How, 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 do we, how do we take that, uh, that greatly? So we have limited palliative care beds in, in the Brampton Hospital. We have very limited palliative care via uh, home care uh, because we have the lowest per capita health care funding in the province. And we have no hospice here in Brampton. So we have very limited access. Um, in terms of the long-term care question that you had, um, uh, here, in, um, here in Brampton, the province uh, has, has them committed to um, a new um, long-term care beds, 168. But it's important to realize that that's just a drop in the bucket because uh, the Peel region has the longest wait lists um, for long-term care. Um, the financial accountability officer um, just came out with a new report just days ago showing that there are now over 37 thousand patients waiting for a long-term care bed and that under the previous government the wait list increased by 78 percent because they increased long-term care beds by only 0.8 percent. Mm. What's also important to realize is that this government is also spinning numbers so during its election um, uh, the Ford's government had promised to put forward 15,000 new long-term <coughs> care beds and they have allocated meaning that they have announced approximately 7,000 um, but those were simply announcements at this stage the amount of beds that have actually been built is only 21 in the first year and during that time uh, the financial accountability officer has said that there's been over uh, 2,000 new patients that have been added to the long-term care waiting list. So we really didn't make any headway. And according, again, to the financial accountability officer, which I find extremely concerning, is by 2034, we would need to add on an, an additional 55,000 long-term care beds just to maintain our current status quo to address our current needs. So that does not even equate to all the new seniors that will be added to that wait list during that period of time. So it does feel like a losing battle. And I think this government needs to start looking at other means in, uh, as a side to simply long-term care. We need to start looking at more home care, more a cohabiting um, 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 uh, or for seniors, other other independent means of actually oh, living oh, with some assistance mm -hmm. when it's needed. We're speaking with Kavinder Gill, a doctor here in Brampton and president of the Concerned Doctors of Ontario. My name is Michael Lake Charbonne. We appreciate you watching and we look forward to hearing your reaction. Respond downstairs and uh, like us on Facebook. Yeah.